All right. Well, welcome to Summer at Adventure Church. It's officially summer for church. I know not on the like calendar, or whatever, you know, I don't know when that is, June or something, but uh, it's summer here, uh, which means school is out, which means parents, you had an awesome week, right? Uh, and uh, we're in the, the flow of summer. And as we do that again, I want to just tell you child dedications. Let me reinforce that. I always feel terrible when parents miss that window. Uh, because we only do this a couple times a year. And so if you have a child that you said, man, we've never dedicated them, we want to dedicate them to the Lord, make sure you sign up for that on Father's Day. Father's Day is going to be awesome. We've got a lot of fun stuff planned. So dads, bring, be here uh, and then go golfing, okay? Just come to church first and it'll be good. And then block parties, as Todd just mentioned. By the way, anybody from my uh, time period think that Todd looks like Freddie Prince Jr.? Come on, right? Look him up. Every time I'm like, man, that's Freddie Prince Jr., you know, uh, she's all that. And so um, he talked about block parties. I would encourage you, my hope is that everybody in the church gets to go to a block party this summer and just see the Dream Center in action. Just go serve, be a part. It's an easy win. Uh, it's, you just hang, up, hang out, you can bring your kids, there's food, there's games, there's a gospel message that they give to the kids and just helping build relationships in our community through the Dream Center. So it's a, there's a few of them on Saturdays, just I think they're like 11 to 1 or somewhere in there, you'll find out online. Uh, but show up, be a part of that, it's going to be awesome. Well, as we kind of transition into summer, this is a time where as a church we kind of take our foot off the gas, if you will. Uh, we don't plan a lot of series or a lot of things outside of Father's Day. We, we'll have some parties on the porch and just some ways to try to encourage you to fellowship and stay connected through the summer. But uh, our attendance, you know, typically drops. There's people on vacation. There's sports in full motion, all that stuff that's happening. Uh, and so we, we kind of leave this the summer block, if you will, as a time to go, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And, and we call it Summer at Adventure Church. And then I told the team, I said, hey, I actually have two series I want to do within that series, Summer at Adventure Church. And the first one's on prayer. And I just was praying and seeking God, saying, God, what do you want to say this summer? I felt like God was saying, hey, let's, let's go back to the basics on some stuff. Let's go back to the basics. Let's, let's prepare ourselves. Again, I believe on, as a church, we're on the verge of something significant of what's going to happen when we make this move. And I want us to be ready for it. I want us to be prepared. And discipleship is a key part of our relationship with God. It's right, We call the followers of Jesus, his, his disciples, you know, the, the disciplines of following Jesus. What does it mean? And we, we have to move beyond at some point just believing in Jesus and going, hey, yeah, I believe he's son of God. It's good, right? Believing is great, but then believing has to, to move to becoming, and if you don't, if, if believing doesn't lead to behavioral changes in our life, then we have to then question, James says, if you really believe what you say you believe, if it doesn't impact your behaviors, then you probably don't believe it. And some of these basics, I thought maybe we could call the series summer school, but then I thought you probably wouldn't come if we called it that. And so, but I want to kind of go back to school a little bit on prayer. And then we're going to spend the second part of the summer on the Bible and what is the Bible and the authority of God, the scripture. How do we <clears throat> approach the Bible? How do we read the Bible? How do we apply the Bible to our life and, and really go through that? And so as we look at the Lord's Prayer over the next few weeks, I was trying to remember back to the first time I heard the Lord's Prayer. And the first time I can remember, I didn't grow up in church. Uh, my family, I didn't get saved till I was about 14. And that's when we kind of started attending church. And so I was trying to think, when's the first time I can remember hearing the Lord's Prayer? And it was watching the movie Rudy. Anybody else seen Rudy, right? And the Notre Dame football team, the good Catholic team that they are, you know, you know, would grab hands and they would recite the Lord's Prayer after the coach's pep talk. You know, coach's pep talk, Lord's Prayer, let's run out of the tunnel and go beat our opponent, right? And that's when I first heard the Lord's Prayer and all these football players had recited it and remembered it. And maybe prayer's been like that for you, like you know the Lord's Prayer. Or maybe the prayer that you know is now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake, whatever, I, I, I pray the Lord my soul to, it's like, man, that's a pretty creepy thing to teach a kid to pray, right? Like, hey, you might die tonight while you're asleep, so let's just pray if, if you do that maybe you'll get in, you know? It's like, whoa, like, but you learn these things, like, God, you know, you have a, a certain prayer that you pray over meals, and it's the same. You kind of recite prayer, and, and we kind of make prayer like this very if you will, religious type of thing, where it's 
We recite things, we do things, and I think we all know that prayer is important and should be an active part of our life. It should be something that, that is a part of our daily routine and what we do. But I know from statistics and from surveys that have been done for people who call themselves Christians or believers, if you will, that that belief in Jesus and that belief in prayer doesn't really translate into an active part of their life. And when asked, hey, do you pray? Eh, Sometimes, you know, for my meal, maybe before I go to bed, first thing when I get up. But other than that, it's just a very religious thing. And if that's the case of our prayer life, we're really missing the point of prayer. Prayer is what establishes our relationship with God. It's what maintains it. It's what matures our relationship with God. And I think we know that intuitively almost, but yet we still struggle to do it. And maybe it's because you feel ashamed and and, and there's this distance between you and God because of your past and some things that you've done and you just don't feel like you can approach God. Maybe for some of you, again, you grew up in a very religious environment and it's it's very like, it's an obligation. I have to pray and so I don't want to do that. If I don't have to do it and my mom's not telling me I have to do it anymore, I'm just not going to do it because it was out of obligation. It wasn't anything that you really enjoyed or you just go, I don't Honestly, Kyle, I don't really know what to say. I, don't, I, mean, I, just, I have my stuff, but I don't know if God's listening. And if he is listening, I don't know if I want to bother him with my stuff. And then, man, I, I, I prayed, but man, what I prayed for didn't really happen the way that I thought or wanted. And God didn't really answer my prayers. So I just really don't even know what the point of it is. So we know we're supposed to pray, right? I mean, MC Hammer said, you got to pray just to make it today, right? You, you got to pray, like... Right, so we know it, but yet we don't do it. If we do, it's not really consistent and not really impactful. We're changing our lives. And there, people always say there is no right way or wrong way to pray, and I understand that on some level. But according to Jesus, there is a right way to pray. And there is a way that we should pray. And if we pray this way, it always works. How many of you want to pray in a way that it always works, right? It works. It, it's, it, it's effective. It, it does what it's supposed to do. But I, and, and please hear me. I didn't say that God always does what you want him to do. But it always works in the way that it's supposed to. And so Jesus teaches us how to pray. Gives us a model, if you will, for prayer. And it's interesting that the disciples struggled with this the same way. And these were religious boys who had prayed their entire lives, had learned prayers, had learned the Torah. They, they knew the, the, these prayers in the Old Testament. They had prayers that they would recite, that they had memorized. And so they, they, they knew how to pray, but yet here they are in Luke 11, 1, and they see Jesus praying, and when he finishes, one of the disciples finally gets the courage and says, all right, God, this sounds a little bit strange, but I know I'm your follower, I'm a Jewish boy, but could, could you teach me how to pray? That's a big question to ask, right? Like, well, you don't know how to pray, you're one of my disciples, of course you should know how to pray. And, but, but whatever it was, they said John taught his disciples, so John had a way that he prayed, and he taught his disciples. He was their rabbi, right? So Jesus is their rabbi. They're essentially taking on his viewpoint, his doctrine, his disciplines into their life. And they go, whatever Jesus was doing, they said, we want to pray like you. When I pray, it's not like you pray, Jesus. And so I want to pray how you pray, because you pray And when you pray and when you go away, and and Jesus was always getting away, right? It says one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And you can read throughout the Gospels. It was like always messing with the disciples. They'd get up and they'd be like, "Where, where is he? He's not in his tent. You know, like, where did he go? And Jesus would come back. And he's like, I was spending time with God. I was praying. Like, Jesus often withdrew. He often got to this place to pray. And whatever he did, however he looked, whatever they saw, they said, Jesus, whatever you're doing, we want to do that. And what we're doing, it must not be right because it's not what you're doing. So teach us to pray like you pray. So Jesus begins his lesson. In Matthew 6, 5, he starts here. He says, and when you pray, everybody say when. Not if you get time, not if you can squeeze me in. Not if, a disciple of mine, a follower of mine, it is assumed, it is just part of the deal, you will pray. But before I tell you how 
to pray, I'm gonna tell you how not to pray. He says, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, on the street corners, to be seen by others. And then he says, and truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So there is a reward for praying and the reward that the religious people do out of obligation, again, that he's kind of saying these are like the professional prayers, if you will, and they're performance-based. And he says they, they put on a show and they use the right words and they say the right things. And he said, and that is the only reward they will get is the applaud of those watching. He says, don't be like them. And Jesus was constantly dealing with these the, and pointing out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He says, if that's why you pray and just trying to get God to do something for you, that's not it. Jesus had zero tolerance for religious pretenders. Zero. Have you ever met anybody who maybe prayed like those guys, right? I know I grew up in church and there'd be people who'd be like, could you pray? And they would like start praying the King James version of the Bible. Thou, God, thou who is most high, shine down on thee. It's like, what, thee? You refer to yourself as thee? You know, it's like weird. It's just like, why do we talk that way? Why do we do it? And Jesus goes, listen, it's not about your words. It's not about how you say it. That, that's not what prayer is. That's the religious people. They think they gotta do things a certain way. That, that's, that's not it. I'm not moved by that. God's not moved by that. So when you pray, he says, my disciples, he's talking to his disciples, true followers of Jesus. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. So important, Jesus is using, referring to God as Father as he tells us how to pray. He says, who is unseen. Can't see him, but he's there. But your Father who is unseen sees you. He sees what's done in secret. And he will reward you. So there is a reward. And the reward the religious people get, that's all they get. But when you go into a place, a private place to pray, and that's the first thing, Jesus is telling them, hey, you want to pray like me? Pray like me. You guys see me, right? I always go away. I always get away. I don't pray in front of you. I don't put on a show in front of you. I get away to pray. And that's the first thing we learn from Jesus and then what he tells his disciples to do. You can pray anywhere, but there are places that are better for prayer when you understand the point of prayer, the purpose of prayer. And he says, you, you'll understand this in a minute. I'm going to get to it, but prayer is, is private. It should be private because it's personal. It's a personal thing between you and your Father who is in heaven. So when you pray, go into a room, close the door, get away from all the distractions. This is you and God. This is you and him. This is where you can be real. You can be vulnerable. You don't have to worry about how you phrase anything, how you say anything. This is just where you can get real with God, your father, who sees you. So get to a spot, a specific place. And I would encourage you to probably make it the same place. Probably try to do it at the same time to establish a routine where you can get away to pray because God wants to connect with you. Prayer isn't just so you can unload your request on God. Prayer is much bigger than that. It's much deeper than that. And we gotta move from give me, bless me, help me to what Jesus is gonna challenge us to do here in understanding that we approach him as father and he sees what we do in secret. He sees the intentionality of you carving out time to relate with him, to connect with him. And it says and when you do that, man, when you have obedience to, to discipline yourself to pursue God in this way, he sees you and will reward you for that type of prayer so what's the reward Jesus is talking about is it getting him to answer all of your prayers if so we've then all asked the question why isn't he answering me and if he's not answering me and that's what he's supposed to do then does he even hear me is he even listening to me but what if prayer isn't about getting God to hear you but rather you hearing from him what if the reward of prayer isn't getting God to move closer to you, but you moving closer to God? What if the reward of prayer isn't getting what we want from God, but getting God himself? What if that's really what you need? 
Not what you think you need, not what you want God to do for you, but what if the answer that you're really looking for is the presence of God to show up in your life? Because listen to me, when you know his presence is with you and that only comes from an intentional investment of time with him, but when you come out of that door and you close it and you face your day, you can go come hell or hard water, I don't care what happens, I know that God is with me. I know that God will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And even as I walk through the valley of death, I don't have to be afraid because he's with me. I got the God of the universe with me. What if that's the reward? You see, prayer isn't about getting what we want from God. It's about getting what God wants for you. The reward isn't getting everything that you ask for. Come on. Any parent knows that. God's way too smart for that. He's way too loving for that. So Jesus says, you gotta get away to pray. And when you pray, verse seven, don't keep babbling like the pagans. Think back to the story of the Elijah, and the prophets of Baal, and it's the showdown on Mount Carmel where Elijah calls down fire from heaven. If you remember the story, if not, go back, 1 Kings 18, and he has this moment, and, and the pagans, the, the, the people who serve Baal, they do all this religious, crazy stuff, rituals, cutting their bodies, doing all this weird chanting all day long, and of course, Baal does nothing, and then Elijah just steps forward and says, God, I know who you are, you know who you are, do what you wanna do and boom, fire comes down, right? And Jesus looks back, he goes, don't keep babbling like the pagans, that doesn't do anything, that doesn't work. For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, your father, there it is again, already knows what you need before you ask him. This word heard here means taken seriously by God. And they thought to be taken seriously by God, I gotta use the right words. And Jesus says, God is not moved by our words. He's not moved by our phrases. We can't convince him with our words to get him to do what we want him to do. You cannot move God in your direction with repetition. That's not what it's about. I don't know about your kids, but my kids oftentimes when they want something and they'll say, hey, dad, can I do whatever, fill in the blank. No, nope. no, not today. No, not right now. No, nope. no, you can't have that. And then, right, then they go, but please, dad, please, it's, please, 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 right? And they like beg you. And I'm like, I'm black and white. I'm Enneagram 8, it's right, wrong, no, no, I said no. Leave me alone, right? And my kids begging, begging and pleading for me to do something, it doesn't change my mind at all. It's still no, right? It doesn't change me, it doesn't move me, it annoys me. And I'm not saying God gets annoyed with you, okay? Don't email me, I know, he's perfect, I am not. I am annoyed by my children. God is love, he never gets annoyed with us. But just maybe there's some similarity there, right? Where God goes, why do you keep begging me? Why do you keep pleading for this? Like, and I'm not always the greatest father, but he, Jesus said, he is the good father. He's the perfect father. He knows all things. He moves sovereignly in our lives. And, and, and listen, I don't give my kids everything they ask for because I love them. Because I want what's best for them. My motives for my kids are for them to become who God's called them to be. Not that they get everything that they want. And so when I say no, it's not because I'm trying to be mean or stingy or withhold good from them, I'm trying to get them to step into all that God has for them. Could it be that God is the same way with us? So Jesus says, don't be like them. They're annoying. They just beg, ah, God already knows what you need. Before you even ask him, he said. And then maybe that makes us ask this question. Okay, if he knows what I need, then why should I even ask? And I think Jesus, and the master teacher communicator he was, does this because he's trying to, to drive home, which he's about to get to, his point of what prayer is all about. 
And he gets his listener here to go, okay, well, if he already knows, then what's the point of even asking? If it's not about convincing God to do my will and God already knows what I, what I need, then why should I even ask him in the first place? And Jesus wants us to ask this question, I think, and when you really think about that question, right, are, are you surprised that God knows what you need? No. You, before you even pray, you know that, right? If you've trusted him and you believe he's sovereign and in control, God, of course, yeah, of course I believe God knows what I need. He's... He sees all things, he knows all things. He created me, he knows me. He has a plan and purpose for my life. But, but maybe we too have reduced prayer to what the disciples had to. That prayer was just about informing God of what we need. And that's the only reason we prayed and the main purpose of our prayer was just, hey God, here's what I need. Let's make it happen, amen. And that's it. If, I think if we're to be honest, and most of us, that's, that's a, a large portion of our time with God. It's just, here it is, God. Here's all my stuff. Here's all my requests. And Jesus goes, listen, guys, disciples, he, he already knows. He, yes, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to your stuff, but we got some stuff to do before we get to you. Jesus goes on. And he's hammering home this point. That prayer is more than just asking God for stuff and telling him what we think we need. He's gonna get to that and he says, but before we get there, we don't wanna spend all of our time there. I know that stuff. That's a portion of prayer, but it's not the point of prayer. The point of prayer is relationship with your heavenly father. This is the big takeaway today, guys. This is the point of prayer. This is why he calls him father and not God. This is why he's referring that he is your heavenly father. That prayer is not about a religious duty to do list. The point of prayer is that God made a way through Jesus for you to have a relationship with your heavenly father. And that everything else in your life, when that relationship is solid and good and strong, everything else from your life flows from that. The reward of prayer is the peace that assures you that God is with you, that he's in control. And again, that only comes from an investment of time and relationship with your heavenly Father. So this is the point of prayer and then why Jesus teaches us to pray the way he tells us to pray. And he says, okay then guys, now that you understand how not to pray and what the point of prayer really is, let me tell you how to pray. This isn't just a formula for prayer. Pray this way. This is how you should pray. Matthew 6, 9, our Father who is in heaven. He's your Father, he's in heaven. He has a different perspective. He has a different view. He's over all things, right? And then he says, hallowed be your name. This word means to revere, to respect, to put in a place of honor, to, to understand who you're talking to, that when you pray, listen, Jesus, and, and we, we, we approach God through Jesus, so I get it, hey, dear Jesus, right? We often start our prayers, dear Jesus, but Jesus didn't say, hey, when you pray, say, dear Jesus, and then pray. We do that all the time, and I'm not faulting anyone for that, but he says, you're not praying to me, you're praying through me to your, who? Father, who is in heaven. So he says, when you pray, start your prayer this way, Start by declaring the greatness of God. Start with worship, right? This is, again, with my kids, again, approaching God as Father. When my kids sometimes, right, especially as they get older and older, sometimes they forget who they're talking to. Hey, you don't talk to me. No, 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 no. I'm not bra. My son Maddox, he's probably watching, listening. So, you know, he, his whole new thing now, he calls everybody kid. I'm like, where did you... Kid, what is it? He'll call me. I'm not your. You are my kid. I'm dad, daddy, and you know what? Right now, you call me father. It should be a little more formal. <laughs> father, 
is what you need to call me, right? You better recognize who you, I think sometimes we make God way too small. We forget who we're talking to, the creator who spoke this world into existence. Study astronomy. Man, I, I read these articles all the time about how the telescopes and everything, they're, they're tracking, they're finding these black holes, these new galaxies, and they'll tell you it'll take 800 million light years to get, and you're like, what, wait a second, how, what did you say? How long would that take? How far is that? Do we have travel? And he's over that. He's over all of it. So he says, you got to remember who you're talking to. This God, this God who has invited you to call him Father, he is infinite. Oh, but he's intimate. And he invites you to come close. This huge, loving, eternal, massive God says, you can call me dad. That's what prayer is about. That's the purpose. That's the point where you start to see God as your heavenly father. And the more time you spend who's recognizing who's in control of your life, the less time you'll spend worried about the things out of control in your life. Right? When you start thinking about how big God is, that prayer request list that you got and you're getting ready to unload on him, all of a sudden those things don't seem so big in light of how big God is. He's huge, he's sovereign, he's in control, he's massive. He's, he's got you, he's got the world in his hands. He's got you, he knows you, he created you, he loves you, he's got a purpose for your life. He sees you, he hears you, he's listening to you. And Jesus says, start right here. God, you are great, you are good, you see me, you love me, you're with me. Come on, that changes how you pray. This is where we start. This is where it begins. This puts everything in its proper perspective that we start with worship. We start declaring the goodness of God and we gotta spend some time here. We don't just rush by this. We stay here as long as we need to. We stay in this place of worship until we sense his peace, until we sense his presence in our lives. So Jesus says, hey, remember who you're talking to. Recognize how good he is, how great he is. Spend some time just worshiping God. Get to a place, get away from it all and just start worshiping God for who he is. Spend some time here and then he continues in verse 10. After you've spent some time declaring how good he is, he says, then pray this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the second part of praying, the way Jesus teaches us to pray is declaring the greatness of God and then bringing our will into submission to his. Surrendering our will. Thy will, not my will. Come on, if we're to be honest, when we pray, come on, I know I fall into this trap. I just bring my will to God and go, God, please do my will. Because I think this is right. I think this is what you would want. God, I think this is how, what you would want for me and my family and what you want for our, God, would you just please do what, what I think you need to do? And he says, no, no you, psh, we're gonna get to you. But before we get to you, you gotta bring yourself into a place where you submit and to surrender to this huge, sovereign, good father who loves you, who sees you, who's with you, and you trust that his will is better than yours. That before we get to our needs, our wants, our wishes, our desires, we get to this place when we recognize who he is, where we can submit and go, God, listen, I know what I want, I, feel, I think I know what I need, but God, before we get to my kingdom, I want you to know your kingdom comes first. Your kingdom over mine, God. Your will over mine. I am submitting to you. Listen, the point of prayer isn't to get stuff from God and to get him to do our will. It's to align ourselves with his will. To allow him to change us to where we become God first people, where we become his agenda first people, where we become his kingdom first type of people. Listen, the purpose of prayer is to surrender our will not to impose it. 
That's the point of prayer. And this is where life change happens. This is where he becomes personal to you, where you surrender your will to his will, where you trust him. Father, before anything else, I want your will. I'm not trying to move you, I wanna be moved by you. Move me to your will. Do in me what you wanna do. My life is yours, I trust you, right? But listen, without trust, you'll never do this. Without trust, you, you don't trust God, right? If, if we're honest sometimes, right, we, we probably think, I think I know what's best. I think I know what God, I, I know what, what I think is right, and I, God, I need you to do what I need, I, I need you to do this for me. I need this job. I need you to move, I need this, God, you, you know it. And we bring our will, but listen, man, you gotta get to a place where you believe first by declaring his greatness that he's good. Do you believe that he's good? That he loves you, that he's for you, that his way is better than your way? You gotta believe that. You gotta get that into your heart where you trust God, you are good. I trust you. In Luke 11, nine through 13, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move through it, but essentially Jesus says, you know, your father is good. You earthly dads, when your kid asks for this, you don't give them something else, right? You give them the best that you can. You do the best you can for your kids. He goes, how much more will God give to you what you need? And he says this, he says, then if you are evil, know how to do good things and give gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? The Holy Spirit to those who are asking him. And he goes through, he goes, ask, ask what you need. Tell God what you need. But remember, the, the, the point of prayer is that you get what? What's the reward of prayer is his presence. It's his Holy Spirit. Because when his Holy Spirit and presence is with you, it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what doesn't go your way. God's with me. He's for me. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I trust him. I know his way's better than my way. I've submitted myself to his kingdom. I'm serving him. My life is his. And as scary as it is to get to this place in our prayers, this is where we have to be. And if we can't get here, in our prayers with God, Jesus essentially says, there's really no point in going any further. If you don't believe he's good, if you don't believe he's over all things, that he's sovereign and in control, why are you praying? And if you can't submit your will to the God who's good and sovereign and in control, what's the point in telling him anymore? So he says, stay here as long as you need to, until you can bring your will into submission to his. And this is exactly what Jesus did in Matthew 26. On the night he was betrayed, what did Jesus do? He got away to pray, didn't he? His disciples were with him. He said, hang here, boys. Stop, you guys stay here. Can you pray for me? I gotta go talk to the Father. Stay here and pray. Keep watch, keep praying for me, right? And we know they fell asleep. It was late, they were tired, they doze off. Jesus goes and prays. And what does he pray? What does he do? What is Jesus doing in the garden, guys? He's wrestling with the will of God. What did Jesus say? He's praying, he goes, Father, you see, I know what I'm about to do. I know what your will is going to demand from me, and I don't think I can do it. The human side of Jesus was begging God for another way. And Jesus stayed there all night until he got to the place where he could say, but not my will. Your will be done. And you and I need to do the same thing in our time with him. See, the length of our prayers isn't determined by the willingness of God, but the condition of our heart. It's not about changing God's mind. It's about changing you and me until we can surrender and trust his will over our own. So, Jesus says, start by declaring the greatness of God and you stay there until you sense it and believe it. You keep praying the greatness of God. You keep telling him how good he is until you believe it. And then you pray for the will of God until you can surrender to it. Hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. He says, and until you believe that, until you surrender to that, just stay right there. And maybe you're like me and there's times and there's things you face in life and you go, I want to be able to pray that way, but I'm just, I don't know that I'm there yet. And I think Jesus would say to you, okay, stay there until you get there. And here's the thing, I'm good with wrestling this with you. I'll wrestle this with you. I'll wrestle my greatness with you. I'll wrestle through my will with you and we'll get there together. But there's no point in going any further until we get to this place first. So that's where we're gonna stop today. And next week, we'll pick up the rest of the Lord's Prayer. But as the band comes and we close out, I'm gonna invite you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. If you're online, please hang with me just a little bit longer. But I think this is what God would want us to do right now is, have you really surrendered to Jesus? Like, have you submitted your life to God, to where you go, God, your kingdom's first? As I said at the beginning, it's not just about believing, it's about becoming, it's about doing, it's about being a follower of Jesus, and you cannot follow him if you aren't surrendered to him. And you'll never surrender to his will until you've surrendered to him as Lord of your life. The Bible says sin separated all of us from God but that God loved you enough and me enough that he sent Jesus into this world and Jesus became the sacrificial lamb of God. He died on the cross and I always love to say that the cross of Jesus Christ bridged the gap between you and your heavenly father. That Jesus made a way through his death and resurrection for you to know your father in heaven. That he has invited you as a son and daughter to call him dad, to call him Abba Jesus, that Abba father, daddy father. That you can have an intimate relationship with the infinite God. That he can move in your life in a real way if you will bow your knee and surrender to him as Lord. And the Bible says we do that by confessing, by submitting, by repenting, turning from our own ways and putting God in control. Maybe you're here and say, God, I need to do that. I've been, I've been in control of my life. I've been doing things my way. I, be- I believe my way is better. I haven't been submitting to God. I haven't been surrendered to him. I haven't been in a relationship with him. And today, you can just sense the Holy Spirit drawing you, saying it's time, come into relationship with me. I want to know you. I want to give you all that I have for you, but it starts with you, just saying, God, I surrender. I surrender to you. So if that's you and you're online, could you tell God that right now, wherever you're at? I know I can't see you, but he can see you, friend. Just surrender to him. Say, God, I surrender. I want you. But if you're here in the room, then you'd say, that's where you're at today. I want to pray specifically for you. But if that's where you're at, say, I need to surrender to God. Would you just lift your hand right now? Say, Kyle, would you pray for me? That's where I'm at today. That's what I need. That's what I want. I see you back there. Thank you. Anyone else? Say, Kyle, pray for me. I want to surrender my faith in him. Amen. Church family, would you pray this with those praying the first time today? Those of you online, say this with us. Say, our Father who's in heaven, Father, we believe today that Jesus is your son, that he died on the cross for me so I can live for you, that through him I can know you and live the life that you've called me to live. I surrender all that I am to you and your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we rejoice with those who made that decision today? Before we sing and close out our time together, I just want to just recap briefly. Remember, prayer, it's not about, doesn't begin with asking. It begins with recognizing knowing who he is. And then it moves to submitting and surrendering. Prayer is about remembering who he is and really who we aren't and bringing our lives in alignment with his will. But like I said, you really can't do that until you've put your trust in him as father. Not just your belief, your trust. You're trusting him, that he is good. Because I get it. Some of you, you've been through stuff. And why didn't God? And why this? Why that? I don't understand. I don't get it. Friend, I don't. 
pretend to have all the answers to that. But I know this, he's still good. He still loves you. And Jesus came to give us a clear picture of who our heavenly father is. And and because of how we relate to our earthly fathers, and you may have had a really great dad or a, a really bad dad, but just because of how we're wired, psychologists believe that the way we kind of can view God is through the lens of how we view our earthly father, whether you realize it or not. And today I wanna just remind you before we close out who your father really is. Jesus shows us, the gospels paint this picture of a father who is intimate, and who's close, who cares, who hears, who loves, and we see that he loves us, that his love is unconditional, not because we deserve it, but because that's who God is, he's love. It's his very nature. It's not based on our performance. It's not based on what we can do. He loves us. He listens to us. This infinite God listens to you. He hears us. When we pray, Psalm 55 says he gives us his full attention. He provides for us. The Father assumes responsibility for, again, meeting all of our needs, not our wants, our needs. And when we come into alignment with his will, he says, it's for me. I got it. It's me. I'll handle it. You're in my will, I'll provide. I'll give you everything you need. He provides, he guides us. Proverbs three, right? Says our Father, our God in heaven. Man, he directs our path when we trust in him. When we acknowledge him. When we understand who he is. He guides, he protects, he shields us. Spiritually, emotionally, physically. Nothing happens without him giving approval. Without him being in charge, he protects, he's over us, he stays. He is not an absentee father or parent. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Today, hear me, please hear me. God sees you. He sees you. He sees you right now. He knows. He knows. He knows. He gets it. He hears you when you talk to him. He's listening. He's very attentive. And he has your best interest in mind. His will is good. Paul said in Romans 12 that when we submit to God, when we surrender all that we are to him, then we will fully understand the will of God. And then he describes the will of God as his perfect, pleasing will of God for your life. Psalm 57, 2, as we close out. The psalmist said this, I cry out to God most high. Cry out, that's praying, right? That's praying, I cry out. To who? The God who's most high. The God who's sovereign. Who has the ultimate perspective over not just my life, over the entire world, over the entire existence of the world, right? That my story is just a part of a bigger narrative of what he's doing. He has a a grand perspective. He's in control. And then look at the promise he says. I cry out, I pray to the sovereign God who's most high, who will fulfill his will for me, his purpose for me. That when we trust God, when we surrender to him, Jesus says the reward is the presence of God and the promise that he will fulfill his will. Would you stand with me? Father, we give you these closing moments as we put into practice what we just learned, as we apply the truth today. God, we start with worship. We start with worship. As we declare your greatness, God, as we surrender to you, God, help us to submit, to surrender, to approach you with with open hands, God, with lives that are ready to serve and to put you first. So God, as the disciples said, teach us to pray this way. Help us to bring, God, our will into alignment with yours today. You are good. You are perfect. And so we pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven